Well, hello, everyone. I want to welcome you today, and we're so glad to be with you if you're watching at home or, or listening. Uh, we also want to welcome our listening audience on AM 570 and FM 102.3. It's a joy and a privilege to be with you, of course. And even though it's been a couple weeks since we've been in person together, I kind of feel like that Rod Stewart song, the beginning at least, uh, have I told, told you lately that I love you? And um, I definitely want to communicate that to you. Um, it's always great to be together, um, but we have this opportunity to encourage each other through God's word, and we want to take, uh, take that and run with it, of course. And so I want to start by uh, just telling you that uh, God loves you and uh, keep trusting in him uh, through, the, through these uh, times of uncertainty and he will be with you. And uh, that's why I want to start by uh, talking with you today about a, an important message uh, titled, Remaining Calm in the Crisis. Uh, studying the word crisis, both in the dictionary and also in the scriptures, you come up with this understanding, and it's this. A crisis is an intense time of difficulty that requires decision-making. When you're in a, in a crisis of any kind, of any size or shape, you are faced with decisions that need to be made, really an onslaught of choices that you have to do and areas that you have to respond to. Well, if that's the case, your best way to get through a crisis is to remain calm. And the Bible talks a lot about you and I being in a state of not only peace, but having a calmness in the trial, in the trouble, in the crisis. Now, a few weeks ago at church, we went through what we call Storm 101, Crisis 101, and that was when Jesus was in the boat with the disciples and a storm came up on the Sea of Galilee. You might recall those passages of Scripture. And in Matthew chapter 8, verse 26, we saw the outcome. Uh, Jesus said to the disciples when they thought they were going to die, he says, why are you afraid? You have little faith. Then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm, the Bible says. Jesus brought, brought a calm to the storm, and the disciples were in complete amazement over it. They thought they were going to die. And all along, Jesus was sleeping in the boat. They wake him up, and then he calms and he rebukes the storm, and now there is peace and tranquility. And Jesus said to the disciples, you know, where's your faith, basically? We've got to build your faith up. Now, that's Storm 101. A little bit later on in the ministry of Jesus, we find Storm and Crisis 201. And this time, the disciples are on the Sea of Galilee, but Jesus isn't in the boat, and another storm erupts on the sea. But this one even more violent than the last. And you could without question say that this is a crisis that the disciples are facing, um, a clear and present danger, if you will. But there's also a context of a bigger crisis that is going on. In this same chapter, we learn that John the Baptist, the beloved John the Baptist, the, the close ally and elder cousin of Jesus, has been murdered. He's been beheaded. And that has certainly sent shockwaves through Jesus and his disciples, no doubt deeply grieved by all of this. Jesus wanting to get alone with the disciples to talk with them more about this, really this incredible moment now that John the Baptist has been taken away from them. And wouldn't you know it, the crowds come. And not only do the crowds come, they come hungry. And they need something to eat. And you have one of the greatest miracles on record. You have, it's recorded in all four Gospels. Jesus feeds all 5,000 men plus women and children. And that was such an impactful moment in the lives of the disciples and it stood with them no doubt throughout their ministry until God himself called them home and now you have the crowd loving Jesus his popularity um, going back all the way to the healing of Jairus's daughter and the hemorrhaging woman his popularity from that point began to grow significantly and now you have him not only healing people now you have him feeding people and so uh, the people they were letting their stomach do the talking but they wanted to make him king by force and so you have all of this going on. You have the crisis of John the Baptist being taken. You have the people kind of confused. Instead of wanting Jesus to, to be the king of their life, they really want him just to be the baker of, for their stomach. And so all of this is going on as we come to chapter 14, verse 22. Jesus is going to tell the disciples to get into the boat. And listen to what it says here in verse 22. And we're going to enter into not only this crisis of losing John the Baptist, but 
the storm crisis, it says immediately he made the disciples get into the boats and to go. Now, he had to kind of push them in. As you, as you direct a child sometimes, when your child doesn't want to go where they need to go, you got to take them by the hands or take them by the hair or the ear. you got to get them in the car or get them out of harm's way. They're not listening. The disciples aren't really uh, listening Jesus' directive here to go over to the other side. And so he has to make them go like a parent would make a child because they're loving all this fanfare right now. Again, Jesus' popularity, as was just stated, is through the roof. Uh, People want him to be king. The disciples are buying into this, but Jesus isn't looking to be made the king they want him to be made. Um, They wanted to make him to be their type of king to fit their needs politically. Now they find out he's he's able to bless and feed everybody, but Jesus is not down with that. And so he makes the disciples go into the boat and to go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. Now, we know from John's account that Jesus didn't go in the boat with them, and so this is the difference from the previous time when the storm erupted. Now, verse 23, it says, after dismissing the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself, notice this, to pray. Well into the night, he was there, the Bible says, alone. We know from Luke's gospel that there are another account where it says that oftentimes Jesus went alone to pray. And this is a much needed trip to the mountain for Jesus. He's been trying to do this all day long. He tried to get alone first with the disciples, but obviously we know the crowds come. And this was his priority to get alone with God. And you might want to jot that down. If you're going to remain calm in a crisis, you need to get alone with God to assess your crisis. You know, you could have a crisis that's just going on in your own heart and your own mind right now. You have to ask yourself the question, how am I doing with getting along with God? If Jesus could do it, which he is the perfect example, obviously, but if Jesus could spend time with God this way, how much more should we be doing it? How much more should we be making an effort to get along with God? A lot of times we let our crisis get control of us because we're not taking our crisis to the Lord. You know, right now, obviously, we are certainly living in some times of uncertainty, but they're not so uncommon. I jotted down some of the the last, I guess, crises that we have had in our culture, and we don't minimize any of them, because uh, with with most of them, except for one, there, there were casualties, and you always grieve over those, but going all the way back to Y2K, remember that? People were buying, you know, three foot, high, tall mayonnaise cans and uh, enough, you think toilet paper is something people want now. People were going nuts for mayonnaise and ketchup because they thought the world was going to end. Y2K, everybody thought the sky was falling. The anthrax scare in 2001, the West Nile in 2002, SARS in 2003, the bird flu in 2005, E. coli in 2006, remember the the economy crash that everything was going to fall apart in 2008, the swine flu in 2009, Remember in 2012, the mining calendar, the world was going to end at a certain date in December. Uh, People were getting all scared over that. North Korea, 2013. ISIS in 2016. And so we've always had these crises that we deal with in recent memory and obviously before that. But it's important to do uh, a common practice in your life every time you have a crisis or you hear about one, and that's to get along with God. Jesus is getting alone with God. How much more do we need to be doing it? And it's certainly convicting because um, as a fellow human, we want to assess our problem in our own strength. But before you could call a meeting, before before you could check your resources, the first thing we need to do is we need to get alone with God. That's what the prophet Habakkuk did, who was tasked with ministering to Judah. This is what it says in Habakkuk 2.1. He says, I will climb up to my watchtower. He was going up to his place, and then God gave him the revelation right after that, you might recall, in chapter 2. I'm going to go get alone with God. i got to get away from all this craziness. Now, where do you need to go to get alone with God? It's vital that you do it. See, everybody is looking for a sense of calmness right now. In fact, an app that's out is the Calm app. And in the Calm app, they actually tell you how you could sleep more and stress less. They talk about meditation. There are sleep stories on there that you could listen to. Um, I don't know what those are like, um, but 
you could fall asleep by listening to certain stories, and you could even watch a few classes um, that'll teach you how to be more calm and however that works. And I think what the Calm app is trying to communicate, which I do think is true, is that being calm is a choice. You have to choose to pursue calmness. You could feed into the frenzy of the crisis, or you could choose the calmness that God offers. You know, Jesus immediately got them into the boat because he wanted to get them away from the craziness. Jesus went to the mountain to pray because he knew it was a priority to get along with God. Uh, that's how we first assess our crisis. See, we will never face the reality of our problems if we're looking at it through rose-colored glasses or the doomsday press. We must get alone with God to assess the crisis. Psalm 23, verse 2, um, it, for many people, has always been a comforting psalm. And in verse 2 of chapter 23, uh, we find out that God himself will sit us down to get us along with him. Look what it says here in Psalm 23, 2. He makes me, you might want to underline that, makes me. So Jesus made the disciples get in the boat. Here, God makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. God wants me to get away from the noise so I can focus on him. Now, there's different strokes for different folks. For some people, they need to get away from the crowd because they're always around people. Some people, they need to get around other people to hear what God has to say. And for all of us, I believe, uh, God wants us to get in a position just to trust him more. But nevertheless, notice he will make you lie down. He'll make you go to the other side. Whether you want to do it or not, at some point, God's going to get you to a point when you realize that you've got to get with him, that you've got to get alone with him. And for some of us, he'll make us literally go on our back to get our attention. He'll use things to get our attention, transitions and troubles and so forth and on. And God wants us to see that. You know, being a dad, one of the, one of the greatest joys, but also one of the things you dread is getting woken up in the middle of the night. And I, I could be a deep sleeper, but if one of my sons calls out to me, I'll get up out of nowhere, and obviously Jen's the same way as uh, other parents are. Well, uh, not too long ago, uh, we, we had a, a heavy wind going on, and on the left side of my house, which is where Ben's room is on the second floor, um, it, it's like a wind tunnel over there. And so uh, you could hear things hitting up against the house, garbage pails and so forth and on. And so uh, Ben's voice came out, and dad, dad, and daddy, and you know, you just wake right up. First you think you're dreaming, and then you wake right up, and I, you, know, you storm into the room, and he asks, could you lay down with me? Now, he's asked me before to come into the room, maybe when he's had some of his coughing attacks. As many of you know, he has a pulmonary and asthmatic condition, um, or when he, he needed to be changed when he was a little bit younger. Uh, but I noticed this, that whenever he's invited me and called me into the room, and he's woken me up out of my sleep and I've come in there, he's asked me to lay down with him, to stay with him, not to take away the storm or his cough. And it dawned on me that how many times have I prayed when I've gotten along with God and I've asked him to take away the storm or to take away the ailment? Maybe I just need to say, Lord, I just want to be with you. Just stay with me. And I think that's the focus that we need to have right now, even with this crisis that we're going through. Yes, we, we don't want to see anybody be sick and die, absolutely. Um, but maybe we just need to redirect our focus on, God, I, I need you with me. And really, that's what Psalm 23 is all about. It's about God's presence. Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will not fear because God is with us. I love the message translation of Psalm 119, uh, verse 114. It says this, You're my place of quiet retreat. I wait for your word to renew me. Isn't that beautiful? God is our place of quiet retreat. If you're going to get through a crisis, if you're going to remain calm in a crisis, the way you do it is you got to get along with God to assess all things in your life, especially the crisis. Because as you do, God will give you wisdom. God will give you knowledge. God will give you strength. God will give you peace. Sometimes we wonder, you know, man, why do I want to wring this person's neck? Or why do I want to just retreat? Or why, why, do I don't have, why don't I have it together? Well, it's because we're not getting along with God like we need to. 
Remember, you will only be stronger when you get alone with God to assess your crisis. It is, without question, the number one thing that a leader or anybody else, a parent, a worker, whoever you are, all of us, we got to get along with God to assess our crisis. If Jesus could spend time with God alone, how much more do we need to be doing it? Now, continuing on in Matthew 14, let's get to the storm here, okay? It says, meanwhile. So Jesus is, it gives, Matthew is adjoining here that, in other words, while Jesus is praying, and I think that is there for a reason. God wants us to know, he's using Matthew to communicate this, that Jesus is praying for the disciples. Meanwhile, it's connected together. He didn't forget about the disciples, you know, hey, you just go over there, I gotta, I gotta get away from you. No, he was getting alone and he was praying for them. Again, the context reveals that they lost John the Baptist. Meanwhile, so G the prayer is still going on. It says the boat was already some distance from the land, approximately three and a half miles. Now it says it was being battered by the waves. We study that and it gives us the understanding that the waves were literally punching the boat, overtaking the boat. It says because the wind was against them. So uh, they were contrary to the wind. This makes, for no punt intended, the perfect storm. Now, all this is going on. Verse 25, it says, Now Jesus came toward them, walking on the sea very early in the morning. Now, go ahead and underline this entire verse in your Bible or in your notes. This is remarkable. Jesus walking on water. Again, we read this, we hear this Bible story. Oh, big deal. Yeah, he walked on water. This is amazing. Uh, we think it's incredible when people do tricks on jet skis. You know, we have Olympics and we celebrate people doing the backstroke and people diving. And, and, and it is amazing. It's astonishing. But this is truly divine, that Jesus defying gravity, uh, walking on water. And not only that, it says that he came to them very early in the morning. Now, you might want to circle that as well. There were four watches that existed for fishermen on the sea. And it's telling us that he came to them very early in the morning, which tells us this is the fourth watch. See, the watches were as such, uh, 6 to 9 the night before, that's watch 1. 9 to 12, that's watch 2. 12 to 3, that's watch 3. 3 to 6, that's watch 4. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm in that boat, you know what I'm thinking? Why can't you come on watch 1, Jesus? Why do I got to go through all of this? Because the fact that He's coming to them. They're at least on the boat nine plus hours, depending on exactly when he came, right before dawn he came. So they're rowing and they are fighting this storm with every ounce of fisherman knowledge as some of them had to do it. They're trying to stay alive and for over nine hours, imagine the blisters that they had. They're completely soaked, but Jesus came to them walking on the water. Now, take notice that Jesus is, he could have swam there. I mean, he, he, could have, he could have got there in record time as well, but he's walking on the water. It's symbolic of a very important point that Jesus is on top of the storm. He's on top of the crisis. And the crisis is his footpath. And a lot of times in our life, when we have a crisis in our life, that crisis becomes God's footpath to come to us. That thorn in your flesh right now that's not God trying to get even with you. He's going to use that to draw you closer to him. That trouble that you have in your life right now, that just might be the pavement that the Lord is going to walk on to get to you because you've been running for a while. It's just how he works. We can't figure it all out. But you might want to jot this principle down concerning God because a lot of times we think God forgets us. And the fact that Jesus has come to them, remember this, recognize that God is fully aware of you and your crisis. He hasn't forgotten you or I. You know, a lot of times we think, oh, man, God, you know, where is God right now in all of this? And certainly people are asking that right now. But even though God is not tangibly with us, he sees exactly what is going on. Even though we can't reach out and touch him right now, uh, he is certainly with us. See, the fact that he was three and a half miles away on the mountain. Now with the mountain, you have a, obviously a greater vantage point and you could see down further when you're up high. 
on when you're on a horizontal view, they say that the human eye could see about 2.9 miles on a straight line. Obviously, up high, you could see a lot, a lot greater distance. But the fact that it's windy, the fact that it's raining, there's got to be clouds. So that's going to obstruct the human eye from seeing no matter where he was. Even if you have binoculars, for crying out loud. So this is not so much that Jesus saw them physically, which he could because he's God. He is seeing them supernaturally. And so when you are going through your problems, keep in mind that God is fully aware of you and me because he supernaturally sees you and I. He knows right where they are, and he comes to them. Now, as he comes to them, it says, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. You would have been too. On top of thinking you're going to die because of being overtaken by the waves, it says they said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Now, that word ghost is phantasma. It's in our English, we transliterate it as phantom. Um, and so they thought there was a ghost. Now, obviously, it wasn't a ghost. It was Jesus. But we need to remember in our life, um, a lot of times people are looking for signs. Listen, look to the Bible here, that God is fully aware of you and I and our crisis. He knows exactly where we are. Even though we maybe can't reach out and touch the Lord, um, even though the Lord may not be walking to us on our stormy sea, we could trust him. It was Emerson who said it this way, all I have seen teaches me to trust the creator for all I have not seen. We must keep that in mind and heart that we could trust Almighty God. Now, a great encouragement to me, and it can be to you as well, is the fact that God, in his infinite loving kindness, deploys blessings to you and I for us to know that he hasn't forgotten us. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. It's a verse we shared earlier this week in our devotions. By the way, if you don't get our daily inspiration, you could sign up for it. You get it every morning. And we've also been recording some videos on it to encourage you that way. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, says it this way. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Now, sharing with you in these verses and devotion that, interestingly enough, um, the U.S. Navy has two hospital ships, and guess what their names are? The USNS Mercy and the USNS Comfort. And just last week, the president uh, ordered that these two ships would be deployed, one to the West Coast by Seattle and one to New York right here in our own harbor. And these hospitals are incredibly equipped with 1,000 hospital beds, much needed right now. Um, they have uh, radi radiology rooms. They have operating rooms. They have other testing rooms. I mean, they're, rem they're floating hospitals. And how appropriate it that these names of these two ships, these two vessels, is mercy and comfort. And I like to think of God that way, that when we're in a jam, he's going to deploy his blessings of mercy and comfort to us. And that's what took place on the Sea of Galilee that day. Uh, Jesus was coming, and he was merciful to come to them, even though they already had Storm 101. Even though Jesus just fed over 20,000 people, they should have enough trust that God's not going to let it end this way. But nevertheless, he shows mercy to them as he shows mercy to you and I. And he's going to comfort them next, we're going to find out. Let's keep reading here now in Matthew 14, verse 27. It says, immediately Jesus spoke to them. So the mercy was him coming. Now here comes the comforting, encouraging words. He said to them, have courage. It is I. Now, I love these, this phrase right here, have courage, um, which really means to be encouraged. When you're trying to tell somebody, the Bible says take courage, it means to take comfort, take encouragement in God's promises. And that's the context here. Have courage, have, find your faith and strength in me. Now, this next phrase here, it is I, you know, the last time that we see a very similar grammatical structure of this phrase is, guess where? At the burning bush, when God was reminding Moses, I am. 
And this is just like God to reiterate this principle here. You know, God is greater than, you know, sometimes people worship fire and water and they worship the, the natural effects of the, of the world. God is over all of that. And, and here it is here now on this water crisis here, this, this we're about to drown crisis. It is I, he reminds them, don't be afraid. Now, again, he wasn't chastising them, as we've said in previous messages with these statements of do not be afraid. He, he's just telling them, don't stay stuck in your fear. Who wouldn't be afraid if they've been rowing for over nine hours and they think they're going to die? He's saying, there's no longer a need for you to be a prisoner to your fear. And that is what God is saying to you and I right now with all that's going on. We don't need to be a prisoner to our crisis. We need to remember over and over again that we could give Christ control of our crisis. Now, Jesus then redirects this conversation, or Matthew does the author, to now Jesus and Peter, because Peter then pipes up and says, Lord, if it is you. Now, you could circle the word if in your Bible. It, Peter isn't doubting that it's Jesus because there's not too many people walking around on the water, to be quite honest with you. So that, that he's not doubting if it's Jesus. Is that really you, Lord? Or is that somebody that just looks like you? No, that's not what Peter's saying. Really, um, in the, the, the Greek clause that is being communicated in the original language is, Lord, since it is you. So since it is you, Lord, Peter answered, Command me to come to you on the water. Now, Peter, you know, Peter has an impetuous personality. I bet you the disciples are just going, hey, shouldn't we just say, Jesus, just calm the storm like he did the last one? But Peter is in awe of Jesus right here. He finds this remarkable what Jesus has done, and his faith is bringing him to say this. And so then Jesus said, come. Now, the fact that Jesus said to Peter to come tells us that Peter's question wasn't sinful. When Peter said, if it is you, Lord, Peter was in no way doubting God because Jesus wouldn't condone that. He saw Peter's heart. He sees my heart and he sees your heart. And then climbing out of the boat, Peter started walking on the water and he came to Jesus. Now, Jesus didn't have to walk on the water. He could have saved them from the mountain. Jesus healed people before, by the way, by just his word, even though he wasn't there. I mean, remember the centurion's servant? So he could do that, but he chose to give the disciples a picture, just like the feeding of the 5,000 plus women and children, a picture that would last in their minds forever. Because they would have to endure another crisis, and another crisis, and another crisis. Uh, ministry and the life of the disciples could be categorized as one crisis truly after another. But their faith was in God. And now, this brings up what I believe is a very important fact when you and I are in a crisis. And you might want to jot this down as well, take notice of this. I need to surround myself with encouragement in the crisis. Jesus is the ultimate encourager. Jesus is, without question, the, the best example uh, to lift us up and to breathe life into a really a, a lithless situation. He's an, also an example that we need to surround ourselves with people of faith in our crisis. We need to be spiritually lifted up. His words were comforting and encouraging. Take courage. Be encouraged. Now, you need to surround yourself with the Holy Scriptures. They will encourage you in this time of crisis, no doubt. We know that faith comes from hearing, and hearing comes from the Word of God. Even if you may, you may be like, well, I've been real religious my whole life, but I really don't know the, a lot of the Bible. Well, welcome to the Club of America. A lot of people could check that box that they've performed the functionality of religion. You know, they've, they've conformed and, and they've been genuine in wanting to do it, but they don't know a whole lot of the Bible. The best thing for your crisis is to be calm, and the best, best place for calmness is the Word of God. And so we see that here with Jesus, because Jesus is the Word, the Word was with God, so we understand all that. So the very Word of God is what gives you encouragement. And the people of God who encourage you with His Word bring you encouragement. How important is encouragement when you're in a crisis? Look what it says here in Proverbs 12, 25. Worry weighs a person down. An encouraging word 
cheers a person up. We need encouragement. And we need it now more than ever before. It was William Arthur Ward who said, Flatter me, and I may not believe you. Criticize me, and I may not like you. Ignore me, and I may not forgive you. Encourage me, and I will not forget you. Now, when you encourage somebody, that leaves, when it's genuine, that leaves a very, very important memory that they're going to need to draw on. I mean, how many of us go through the storms of negativity in our mind? How many of us have one trial after another in our life? Encouragement truly is oxygen for our soul in these times. We need it. Now, in the Bible, there's lots of unsung heroes that you don't hear too many books written about or messages given on. One of those is a man by the name of one Sephorus. He was an ally of Paul, and he remained loyal to the apostle during some difficult times in Asia. Look what it says in 2 Timothy 1.4. He says, May the Lord grant mercy to the household of one Sephorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. Now, one Sephorus. Now, that's obviously, that's not a very common name, but what does the name one Sephorus mean? It means to bring profit. What, we, what it means then is that one Sephorus was somebody who profited others, that just by his presence, it was profitable to people to have him there. And that's what the Bible says, that he refreshed Paul. I want to look at this two ways. First of all, you want to get along with God because he's going to refresh you. You want to understand that the words of Christ, they will encourage you. It will refresh your parched soul. Right now, if you're in a crisis right now of any kind, you need the encouragement of God. Why go anywhere else? It's the best. Also, look at this from another way. Don't just look to get encouragement. Look to be an encouragement. People need encouragement. I heard about George Truitt. He was a tremendously effective pastor out of Texas. Sadly, one day on a hunting trip, he accidentally shot and killed his best friend. His daughter said that she never heard her father laugh after that day. He had a radio program, and at the end of the radio program, this is what he would say as he closed it out every time. He said, be good to everybody because everybody is having a tough time. I think Truett understood personally the burden that people carry. See, sometimes we cross paths with people that are like sandpaper in how they act. There are some people that, you know, they're as cold as ice, or some people that are extremely difficult, some people that are just so hard to like that you say, you know what, I could love them in Christ, but I don't got to like them. People talk about that all the time. Here's the thing. God wants you and I to be an encourager because you don't know what crisis somebody might be in right now in their own life, what they're carrying on in. Certainly Jesus could come on the boat, come on the water here and rebuke the disciples. He'd undo that. Certainly he could point out how lousy their faith is. Hey, we had storm 101. Have you gotten it yet? He doesn't do that. Instead, he encourages them. And we need the encouragement of Christ and we need to give it out. See, remember what it said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, that blessed be the God and Father of, of mercy and comfort, that he's comforting us so we could be a comfort. God is blessing you and I with encouragement so we could turn around and give it to others. So we want to surround ourselves with people of encouragement, and we want to be people of encouragement in a crisis. When you are encouraging to others in a crisis, it helps you to deal with your crisis. But if you're going to be negative, if you're going to uh, continue to, to blame shift, if you're going to continue to scapegoat your own bad behavior, you're only going to dig your hole deeper. You remain calm in a crisis when you keep being the blessing that God has saved and guess what? Equipped you to be. It's easy to love the people who are lovable. It's easy to commend people who do exactly what you tell them to do. Listen again, Jesus made them get into the boat. This storm did not catch him by surprise, 
but he's giving them a lesson of all lessons, and I think God does that for you and I. He wants us to remain focused on the big picture, and the big picture comes down again always to, be, to trusting God and to remaining still in his presence and being calm. That's what we need in a crisis. So let's wrap these great verses up here in Matthew 14 by looking at how this turns out. Jesus comes to them on the water. He tells them to take courage. Peter then says, Lord, if it's since it's you, let me come out to you. Peter steps out of the boat. What incredible faith, by the way, by Peter, because nobody else got out of the boat. Peter gets out of the boat. Now, verse 30 picks up on, I don't know how far Peter walked. Did he walk four steps? Did he walk seven steps? I don't know. I don't care how much he walked. He got out of the boat, which was incredible. I, I don't know if I would have got out of the boat, but Peter gets out of the boat, and it says, but when he saw the strength of the wind, he, he was afraid again. Now again, this is Peter, a, a great example in the faith. But even Peter was afraid, and he took his eyes off of the Lord, and it says this, immediately beginning to sink, he cried out to the Lord, save me. This is like his one phone call, if you will, okay? And he's going to use his quarter on Jesus. Lord, save me. By the way, if you're watching and listening, if you've missed or forgotten everything else, don't miss this. The best prayer you could pray in a crisis of any kind is, Lord, save me. Maybe you need that right now. Maybe you've never trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Jesus Christ died for me, died for you. He defeated sin and death. He sits at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. The only way you get to heaven is to pray that prayer, Lord, save me. If you're in a crisis right now of any kind, if you've been rowing and rowing and rowing and you haven't made any progress, you could cry out and say, Lord, save me. Now, verse 31, it says, immediately Jesus reached out his hand. He caught hold of him and he said to him, you have little faith, why did you doubt? Now that word doubt in the Greek language means to be divided. In other words, Peter, why are you divided? Why do you have faith to get out of the boat and to walk on the water, but then you then turn your mind to doubt, you're looking at the storm. In other words, Jesus is saying, why are you divided between me and the storm? Why are you trying to say, Crisis, Christ. No, it's just me. And that's a word for you and I. That if we're going to step forward, we have to stay in faith to rise and really stay above our crisis. You might want to jot that down as well. I got to step forward and I got to stay in faith if I'm going to stay above my crisis. Why'd you doubt? You have little faith. So Peter had some faith. And if that little faith got him out of the boat, how much or how little faith does the other disciples have for not getting out of the boat? And what is my faith like if I don't want to get out of the boat or your faith like? Now, verse 32 says, when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. It's the same exact occurrence of what took place previously on the Sea of Galilee, that Jesus brought a calm to the storm, and he does it here again. It's a reminder of all reminders that even if Jesus has calmed your storms before, he could do it again now. You don't just get one storm to be calm. Oh, I'm out of my storm card. I can't ask for that again. Thank God that he is powerful enough. That he's sovereign over all these things. And in his majesty and his holiness, thank him for the First storm, he calmed. The second storm, the tenth storm, he calmed in your life. You've probably lost count. In fact, you could spend from now until the end of the year praising God for all the storms that he has calmed in your life. Now, verse 33 says, then those who were in the boat worshiped him. Now, before you get to that part, John's gospel tells us that they, they were immediately on shore. Now, wait a second. They were rowing all night. They didn't get anywhere. Rowing and rowing and rowing. Not only did Jesus calm the storm, he supernaturally transported them from where the storm was to solid ground. In an instant, he did that. They're rowing and rowing and rowing, not getting anywhere. Maybe that's how you feel right now. You're rowing and rowing and rowing, not getting anywhere with your family. 
You're rowing and rowing and rowing, not getting anywhere financially. You're rowing and rowing and rowing, not getting anywhere with your health. Keep trusting God to save you. Keep trusting the Lord. Within an instant, he could calm the storm and transport you to the safe ground where you need to be, to the solid ground, to the, the place that is higher uh, than you need to be. That's what God could do. That's how great he is. That's his majesty. That's what God is capable of doing. And my prayer is, is that you would believe that right now in your own heart, that you would not be walking around thinking that God can do it. You know, I'm reminded of what Moses said to the Israelites in Exodus 14, 13, he said this, Do not be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. And that is what God is saying to me and you right now. Just stay calm. That you are my child that I have plans of blessing, I have favor for you, I, I have purposes for you. And this storm, although it might be threatening your life, it can't touch what I have planned for you. And so it is true with all that we're going through right now with this virus. Yes, it may have interrupted our normal routines. Yes, it may have disturbed plans that we had. But God is fully aware of you and I and that which we are going through right now. He transported them instantly. I mean, there's a miracle after miracle here. He's walked on the water. He's rescued Peter. He's encouraged the disciples. He tries to build them up and tells them you need to have this faith. And now he transports them to the other side. And maybe you need that right now. You need God to transport you from your crisis to safe ground. He could do it. He could do it for our city. He could do it for our country. You know, in America today, thank God for those in leadership in their states or in, in Washington and the government who have a healthy fear of God. We need that. God didn't inject anybody with this virus, but he will use this pandemic to get our attention. And hopefully people are listening that our trust needs to be in God, that that's where the calmness lies. I heard a story that um, really stuck with me about somebody who I respect. He's an announcer for the NBA on TNT, Ernie Johnson Jr. And he really does a great job, um, and he's also called baseball games for uh, the Turner Broadcast um, as well. And in 1997, on December the 10th, when he saw that his career was taking off as a 41-year-old man, um, he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And he actually wrote this prayer down. He said, my trust is in Jesus Christ for everything. Enough of the me-centered life. I want to live a Christ-centered life. Now immediately, things began to change in Ernie Johnson's life. He started watching how he talked because eh, like, like many of us prior to Christ, our mouths weren't too clean with what we said. He watched some of the things he did and his behaviors. And people started noticing the change, and the biggest person noticed the change was his wife, Cheryl. So much so that she said, I don't think you're the man I married 15 years ago. Well, sooner than later, um, Cheryl would come to her own crossroads, and she would um, follow right along suit. But then life began to really take a twist. Even though Ernie had put his faith in Christ, a biopsy came back, and it was revealed that he had Hopkins lymphoma. And it really rocked his world. And he met with his pastor one day at lunch about this crisis that he had now in his life. And again, sometimes we think, you know, we put our faith in Christ, we're going to have no problems. Everything's going to go great. Not so. And so he met with his pastor, and this is what his pastor asked him. He said, Ernie, I know you have your faith in Christ. He goes, but what does that look for you right now? Because right now, Ernie wasn't calm at all. And Ernie said, I'm just not sure right now. Maybe you can help me. And so the pastor took a napkin in that restaurant, and he began to write on it. And Ernie still has this napkin to this day. And this is what the pastor started writing on the napkin. And you might want to get your own napkin and write this, by the way. He wrote the word trust, put a question mark. He wrote underneath it, trust, put a comma. 
he wrote underneath it, trust, comma, then if, dot, dot, dot. Then he wrote underneath that, trust, comma, when, dot, 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 dot. And then he stopped writing after he wrote, trust God, period. Now, since that time, back in 2003, Ernie now signs his signature on all of his emails and correspondence that way, trust God, and then he wrote, writes out the words, period. That is what's going to bring you and I calmness, that we step forward in faith, trusting God, period. See, our trust does not need to be in a vaccine that's going to come from somewhere or some stimulus bailout package. Our trust needs to be in God. Our trust needs to be in Jesus Christ. You know, if you're listening to this right now, you need Jesus Christ as your Savior, just say these words, Lord, save me. If you're in your crisis right now, say these words, Lord, save me. And God is faithful to do it. Trust, period. Trust God, period. Throw out the commas. Throw out the, the hyphens. Trust God, period. As we close, I'm reminded of the words Zephaniah said in Zephaniah 3.17. Uh, this prophet spoke during the times of King Josiah. And he said, for the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty warrior. He will take the light in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all of your fears. My prayer is that you believe that today, that you have received God's word in your heart, that God has planted it in you, and that you will remain calm in your crisis, and you will trust that God will see you through, period, because God promises by his good graces and goodness to calm all of our fears. My friends, we're not sure what tomorrow holds, but we know who is in charge of tomorrow, and that is the Lord our God. And so some may trust in horses and chariots. But our trust is in the Lord our God. In this time of uncertainty for many people, business owners, parents, those who have family members who are sick and struggling, let us be faithful to stand on God's promises, to step forward when we need to, and to stay in faith this day and all the days to come. May God bless you. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins and rose from the dead. We ask for his peace that surpasses all human understanding to cover us and for you to give us a divine and holy calmness in our life right now. Help us, O oh God, to step forward and to stay in faith. Help us to say those powerful words in prayer, Lord, save me. We thank you for the cross and the empty tomb. And we sow these words of calmness in you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. God bless you.